My name is Marcy Woodmaski and today I'll be providing a critical reflection on child development. To begin, let us look at what child development is. According to McDevitt et Alia, child development is a study of the persistent, cumulative and progressive changes in the development of children and adolescents. The study of childhood development can be categorised into three different domains. Physical development addresses the biological changes to a child's body. Cognitive refers to the changes in a child's ability to reason and to develop their language. And social emotional studies their changes in their emotions, relationships and moral reasoning. The most important thing that educators must keep in mind is that whilst all these domains can be studied separately, they are all highly interrelated. One domain will influence the de development of another. Child development can be studied in time periods. Today we'll look at four different time periods, beginning at infancy, which is from birth to two years, followed by early childhood from two to six years, then middle childhood, six to ten, and finally at early adolescence, from 10 to 14 years. Whilst child development can be explored in time periods, it is crucial to remember that these are only a rough guide and all children develop in their own time and way. Infancy is recognised as a time of rapid growth. During this time, a child's brain architecture starts developing and is highly shaped by their experiences. Physically, infants start developing motor skills. Gross motor skills enable them to roll over, then to sit alone, followed by being able to crawl. By 12 months, they start walking, which is followed by climbing and then by running. Infants also develop fine motor skills and are able to hold crayons, turn pages in a book and self-feed by the end of infancy. Their language development begins by crying, gesturing and babbling. At about 12 to 14 months, children will usually speak their first word and by 18 months, children will start using two-word sentences. Educators can foster language development by continuously initiating conversation, being good listeners and repeating words that children say. Strong bonds start to form with their caregiver. Trust in these relationships is key for emotional development. At about seven months, student might, children might show strong attachments to their primary caregiver. This is recognised by crying when being separated from them. In early childhood, Children have now become very confident in walking and running and they start to skip and gallop. At this age, children also start to begin to care for themselves by doing the activities such as dressing themselves and going to the toilet on their own. As the child's memory starts to increase, they are able to start being able to perform cognitive abilities such as being able to count numbers and recognise and identify common objects. At this age, children start to become more engaged with their peers they start to share, smile and cooperate with others. Educators should encourage a child's passion to try new things and use their imagination, as well as providing them with stimulating environment to try new things. In middle childhood, a child's body begins to change in structure. For example, they lose their 20 baby teeth. Their gross and fine motor skills start to progress forward. Their ability to now kick, catch and run is more coordinated, which results in participation of organised sports. Kids' language skills start to vastly emerge. They are now able to hold conversations. Their ability to reason starts to form and they begin to self-evaluate. Their relationships start to evolve and change by becoming comfortable with trusting people that aren't in their immediate family. Early adolescence is seen as a time of dramatic change as children start entering puberty. They start experiencing significant growth and they lose their childlike bodies. The release of hormones creates such physical changes as their appearance of facial hair and the beginning of menstrual cycle. Along with physical changes, adolescents start to become self-conscious and start to question how their peers see them. Their relationships broaden and a heavier focus is placed on the relationship with their peers. They may experience occasional moodiness and challenges with their parents and figures of authority. During this time, educators can assist them by providing them with the support they need, like giving them strategies to tackle more difficult subjects or giving them a time to seek help for academic and social matters. As educators, it's important to understand each theoretical approach and know how to use different parts of theories when teaching. As stated in the early learning framework, different theories about early childhood inform approaches to children's learning and development. Early childhood education is drawn draw upon a range of perspectives in their work. Theories' ideas are independent of each other, but when put together, they provide a good overall understanding of how children develop as they age. 
Listed within this slide are a number of theorists across the three developmental domains. Within the next few slides, we will highlight the work of some key theorists in more detail. Jussel developed the maturation theory of child development. He believed that child development is directed from within by the actions of genes. For example, when a child first gains control of their body, the order is always the same. It begins with their lips and tongues, followed by their neck, arms, and then trunks and legs. Jussel observed patterns in the ways that children develop, which showed that all children have very similar stages of development. But each stage moves through these stages at their own rate. Aspects of his theories can be used today by identifying a list of normative behaviour for children at a specific age. Jean Piaget believed that children think differently than adults and proposed a stage theory of cognitive development. He believed that there is a pattern to the way children learn to think and this pattern occurs in four stages. His firm belief was that children must master each stage before moving to the next. As child matures, they pass through each stage into more complex thinking. This resulted in thinking that children at an early age can't solve complex problems. However, in recent times, a successful implementation of educational approaches such as Vegio and Melia have proven that children can indeed perform complex cognitive processes. He believed that children must be presented with stimulating environments in order to explore, discover and experiment. Educators can apply his theory by treating children as active learners, by listening to them and helping them find their own answers. Elliot Erickson focused on the importance of social experiences impacting and shaping a child's physiological growth. His theory outlined eight different stages that people go through in their entire lifespan. His theory stated that during each stage that people face a crisis that they must overcome. Overcoming this crisis will lead to the development of a healthy sense of self. The crisis that children face have a positive and negative outcome and this is highly shaped by their experiences and environment. Therefore, the role of an educator here is really important. For example, it is important for educators to build trusting relationships with a child and to encourage and respect their needs. All children come from diverse backgrounds and no two children will be the same. When addressing our diversity, there are many things to consider. For example, a child's cultural and linguistical background. Culture has an effect on a child's beliefs, values and behaviours. In such cultures as Asian and Aboriginal, there is a strong belief placed on the obligation one has to their family. Additionally, communication styles at home may vary. This includes speaking an English language other than English or different ways of interacting. In Aboriginal communities, children are taught to avoid direct eye contact with adults as it is rude. Aboriginal children may also shy away from answering questions in class because in Aboriginal culture, the art of storytelling is prevalent. It is not about asking questions and getting answers. Considering a family dynamic and socio-economic situation is also important. Knowing if a child's parents are together or separate, if there are siblings present, or if parents are facing any hardships is important. Taking note of children that are gifted in certain areas or have learning disabilities is also important. In both situations, if not if addressed properly, development for a child can become frustrating. For a gifted child, tasks may become boring too easily and they will lose interest. Or for a child with a learning disability, they may encounter difficulties with processing information resulting in a loss of confidence. In order to assist with healthy development of children, educators must spend time getting to know each individual. Educators should observe children and look out for any abnormalities and identify their interests. Developing a relationship with a child's parent is crucial for healthy development, keeping in mind that for some cultures, such as the Aboriginal community, there may be more than one adult, two adults present that are significant in a child's life. Educators should build supportive and safe environments for children to grow in, explore and learn. Additionally, to address diversity, educators should create activities that are inclusive and flexible, ensuring that children of different cultural backgrounds and development speeds can feel comfortable and build confidence. For example, including Aboriginal stories and achievements can make an Aboriginal child feel more accepted and boost their self-identity. Alternatively, explaining things in many different ways to a child whose first language is not English can make them understand things more clearly. Thank you for listening.